Hello again, and welcome back to our real-time tutorial series on painting the miniatures from the A Song of Ice and Fire tabletop miniatures game. Today we'll be combining the footage from two different sittings that happened shortly one after the other in the same day. The main focuses are going to be adding brown and black, which cover a significant number of the surfaces on these miniatures. Technique-wise, it'll be very similar to what we saw in the last episode, just more of the same. We're going to be mixing our inks a little bit today, and keeping in mind the addition of thinner in order to help them blend together with other colors where necessary. Using our black and brown, we'll be covering pretty much any leather surface or any skin of any of the characters, as well as the cloak on Ms. Mormont, and the horse under the blackfish. I don't have much else in terms of general comments, since technique-wise we're going to be sticking to something pretty safe. As with the last episode, there will be an index in the description of the different times at which I make comments, and a general description of what that comment is. Hopefully, between that and some judicious scrubbing throughout the episode, you can find some sections that are interesting to you and hopefully helpful as well. Now without further ado, let's get started! Starting off here, I'm going to be doing the first blending of inks that we've done so far. This is very easily done. Just swirl the two together with your paintbrush. Remember to keep on that twist in your wrist so that you can keep the point and not just fan out the bristles. My choice of colors here was informed by my own Gambazon, owned at home. Using objects that you own at home, just like using an art book or using Google, is a very useful source of inspiration for how you're going to color things. In my case, it started out as a dusty beige, and through use and contact with oil on armor and weapons and such, went a little bit brown. I'm using that final shade of slightly brown Gambazon as inspiration for her coloration to show that she herself is no stranger to combat and has probably worn this on more than one occasion already. This isn't a fresh clean Gambazon, this is the Gambazon of someone who knows how to use that big old mace she's got over her shoulder. I ink all skin areas in brown when I first start out with a miniature, just laying in a bit of a base for the shadows of the face. Since I'm going to be building up the color I use for skin, particularly in these generally fairly generic Caucasian characters, from a base of brown, white, yellow, and red, having the shadowed areas be a deep brown kind of makes sense. 
The browns will work together, and the two colors should look fairly similar when placed side by side. This is a good occasion to talk about that kind of color cohesion, particularly when you compare it to techniques that may involve you painting the entire miniature with acrylics, then washing it by dipping it or otherwise just slathering on an ink wash afterwards. In a lot of those techniques, you just lay on either a brown, for those who are particularly sophisticated, or a black ink. While there's nothing wrong with these techniques in and of themselves, and they are fairly easy to implement, so I do recommend you try them if you're really pressed for time, they don't result in a particularly realistic effect. The reason for that is sort of obvious, I suppose, when you think about it, but not immediately obvious if you haven't thought about it, which is fair. The shadows on objects we look around at, while we think of shadow itself being black, are rarely black. If you look at a red pillow, the shadow is going to be a dark red. So if you're just laying on a generic color, or just black, you're not going to end up with very realistic looking shadows. Even by using brown ink, which does, admittedly, give a little bit better effect, and I would prefer that, generally speaking, with my miniatures, you still get a muted effect over the entire miniature, where the shadows don't look quite right, and the entire miniature is sort of dull, because all of the colors have been pulled together in tone. All that is to say, though, if you want to do an overall wash with the same color, certainly you're free to, and it will give you some effective shading, and will use what the sculptor gave you, which I'm always in favor of. However, if you want a slightly better effect that will even be apparent at tabletop distance, the old quote-unquote three-foot rule, which I think I mentioned last episode, you'll want to use a wash for each area that is that particular color, or the base color for that area that'll tie in together and look a little better. That's what these inks are doing for us, as they're doing the wash, and in many cases, they're also providing us the primary color. What I'm doing now is targeted shading of areas on the Gambazon that I know should be darker than the rest. These are areas that are shaded by belts, or for example, the tabard. By helping concentrate and pool the ink in those particular areas, we can get a slightly darker effect there. That makes sense based on how the shadows would fall. What I'll be doing after this is feathering it a little bit with the brush, making sure there's not much ink on it, and then just dragging it around to make sure that it blends in with the other inks. This can be a good step to add sometimes when you're looking at a miniature with a lot of sharp edges that you can see would cast very distinct shadows. Feathering it in like this after you've just applied the wash rather than doing it at a later stage can help you blend the colors together a little easier.
Now, Brienne of Tarth, as we know, is a blonde. As such, we're going to be giving her blonde hair in this case. To do so, I'm not just applying yellow ink or any yellow coloration, I'm also mixing in a little bit of brown. While just using yellow might make sense to you, like it did for me, I should show you at some point my Jamie Lannister miniature, which I'm definitely going to have to strip and redo at some point. Just adding yellow paint or ink, either or, to the hair of a miniature you want to be blonde ends up really just looking like highlighter. Yellow pigment on its own, that bright in particular, isn't found on many things in the wild. I mean, it's found on the handle of my palette knife in the background there, but not on most natural things. And that includes blonde hair. Adding a little bit of brown will pull it in a little more with the natural tones of stuff like leather and the skin that you're using. And honestly, the brown will mostly show in the crevices, while the yellow mostly shows on the surfaces. This, in my opinion, makes for a much more realistic blonde hair look, and I strongly recommend doing that. Although I also recommend using just straight yellow on a miniature at some point, just to see how bad it looks.
you're wondering why I just stopped painting and grabbed my red ink, of all things, I just noticed that the reins of the Blackfish's horse pass through his hand. He's holding them up to his chest, and there's a little bit sticking out. It's probably pretty common that you'll notice little things like this while you're going on painting, and going back and correcting them is fairly easy. The only thing you want to keep in mind is if the area you just painted next to it, for example, his hand in this case, is going to be affected at all by what you're doing. In this case, I judged that the red honestly wasn't that big a deal, red and brown being fairly close enough, especially when they mix, that on the border I wouldn't even notice. As such, I've gone ahead to make the correction now. Too easy. If you like watching people scramble, you're in for a good one here. I'm thinning out my black ink fairly substantially because the black ink on its own is incredibly opaque and so is not really great for shading things in the way all of the other inks are. While they let underlying surfaces show through, my black ink on its own is an exceptional calligraphy ink and so lays on very, very dark. As such, where it might be acceptable for me to use one drop of thinner even for most of my other inks to get them down to a much thinner stage. With the black, I end up having to use a significant amount more. What's worse, my phone memory ended up filling up while I was doing that. I didn't notice because I was dealing with the flow issue where my ink was trying to run away on me. And so I ended up painting in Ms. Mormont's cloak without having my camera running. My sincerest apologies for that. The cloak was a fairly easy job it being a large area with a lot of crevices to absorb the ink, so I ended up just laying on heavily watered down black ink, and it sank in and gave it a very nice texture that you can see even from here on the camera. I'm very sorry you didn't get to see it, we'll be going over it again later, so hopefully you can take a closer look in other episodes. Thank you all for bearing with me as I sort out my technology. From here on out, I'm much more aware of the space limitations on my phone's SD card, and so there shouldn't be any other footage that gets lost to me being distracted while my phone stops filming.
There have been some examples already of the difficulty of washing large, flat, or smooth surfaces, such as the haunches of this horse, but here we're going to see it in particular, as I try to add a little more ink on top of ink that's already starting to settle. The small difference in viscosity between the two means that the two don't lay onto each other quite right, and you'll start seeing streaks immediately. That can be fairly worrisome, but if you watch here, after I laid on those couple of strokes on the haunches, the thinner that I've added into the ink has helped it sort of blend into what had already been laid on before. In order to help mitigate the issues of this further, you can try to keep in mind the direction that muscles would ripple, or that the metal would shine when laying it onto another smooth surface such as a shield, and try to paint along those lines. That way, if any ripples do remain, they should look intentional. It can also be useful in these cases to be trying to use more of the side of your brush rather than the point. The side of your brush will spread the effect of your brush strokes a little wider, and leave it on in slightly more even layers, whereas if you're using the point, you'll be getting it much more focused, and a single focused line in the middle of a flat surface will look much more noticeable. Fortunately, although I'd done the entire rear of Ms. Mormon's cloak earlier while my phone had not been filming, I proceeded to do the front now while my phone was operational. Unfortunately, it decided to take the opportunity to focus on my thumb. Hopefully you can interpret past that though, and see that the brush strokes needed for this are very simple. And really all I'm doing is charging my brush quite heavily, with very little glamour or technique to it, and not wiping off any of the extra ink. In this particular case, with a surface this rough, I want a decent amount of fluid on the brush. That fluid, having been so heavily thinned, will flow into the gaps, and it's going to be doing a lot of the work for me in terms of making that look textured. As you'll hopefully see in the glamour shots at the end of this video, I think it worked out quite well.
As the last step of this setting, I'm going to go back and add a little bit of filth to the mountain's accoutrement. As it is, I find the yellow too bright, a little bit more like that highlighter I was discussing earlier when talking about making blonde hair. And I want it to be a little dirtier. I want it to reflect the mountain himself, looking like A, a dirty souled evil man, and B, a hardened campaigner who's likely been wearing all of this equipment for quite a long time while he was going around and killing babies or whatever it is he does for fun. As such, we're going to mix up a little more of our yellow and brown and add some thinner to it, then just lay it on over top of the yellow we added previously. Our previous yellow and brown has settled in by now, but the thinner is going to help this second layer blend with it a little bit, loosening up the first layer from where it sat and helping the pigments get cozy with each other as they settle into the crevices once again. This second coat I'm going to try to keep reasonably light, and in this case, for example, where I've put on quite a bit and I've managed to spill it elsewhere, I'm going to be trying to wick some of it away afterwards. I want this to be an accent and to blend in well with what's underneath, not to overwhelm it and look like a color all its own. I'm not representing muddy water having pooled in particular, but rather sweat and grime that's been caked on. As such, after having wiped off my brush on my palette, I'm using it to just push around all of the stuff I've already pooled on, pressing it into the cracks where I want it to be and away from the open surfaces where I don't really want it to be as dark. Now as I mop up my mess and remind myself that I need to clean my brushes after all this, we're going to transition into the glory shots again. With that, I'd like to thank you all for having watched this far. Today we've gone over blocking in additional colors, those being mainly brown and black, as well as adding some additional layers to colors we've already laid down, particularly in the case of the mountain's accoutrements. I hope this has been helpful to you, and I hope you'll tune in for the next episode as we continue to add color to these miniatures. Until then, go play some games.